We'll move swiftly on to session four, which is on emerging presence of the, the Black Sea, what, what place in Asia. Uh, for this session, um, we're very fortunate to be joined by Nikolay Gorbachev, President, Ukrainian Grain Association, and Dr. Rory Deverell, Senior Commodity Risk Manager of INTL FC Stone. Both of our speakers will give their presentations for around 20, 25 minutes, after which if we can save the questions to the end for both of our speakers, that would be, that would be great. So our first presenter is Nikolai, President of the Ukrainian Grain Association. Nikolai has more than 20 years of experience in the Ukrainian grain market. He became the head of the Ukrainian Grain Association in February 2017. He is also the co-chairman of Grain and Oilseed Committee of the European Business Association. Nikolai also works, whilst working in the association, at the same time holds the position of director at the company New World Grain Ukraine Souffle Group. Nikolai's presentation is on Ukrainian Black Sea grain market, future prospects and opportunities. Thank you, Nikolai. Thank you very much. I would like to thank to the organizers uh, to be a member of such big event in Asia. It's my first conference like a speaker in Asia, and it's in Australia. It's, uh, I think it's the best country in the world because uh, nice climate and infrastructure like in the United Kingdom. I think it's the best choice. <laughs> That's why I'm sure Luke just uh, begged from, uh, even from Geneva because in Australia, of course, much better. I would like to start my presentation from the small video. If it's possible, can you, from the beginning, just switch on my small video? Because uh, I gave it was in uh, two different files. I think it will be easy to understand what does it mean, Ukraine. Thank you very much. I think now for me it will be more easy to go more deeper in details in grain trade and grain export because Ukraine is a young country. 
It's just after the crash in USSR, it's 1991 when we start to be independent. It's first time in our life. Ukraine tried to be independent on the past 300 years, but uh, we every time was uh, under the pressure of Russia. And we are trying now to move out from this pressure. And the uh, agriculture sector, of course, it's very important to our country. I would like to explain to you what is the Ukraine. Our official population is 42 million people. But honestly, we just make a recalculation for the population through the bread consumption, and we didn't find even 35 million. I think about, uh, about 10 million people just disappeared somewhere. <laughs> they moved to live to Poland, they moved to live to Russia, they moved to live somewhere else. For example, I have read uh, one article in Poland uh, where officially about two million people, Ukrainian people, officially walk, and how many unofficially, I don't know. That's why our population just decreasing. We are the biggest country in Europe on a territory. We've got uh, very nice soil. We've got uh, nice neighbors, except our, the biggest one. <laughs> with whom we have now a problem. But I think uh, all this politician question, we will leave <laughs> and uh, we'll continue to talk only about uh, business and grain. I am absolutely not from political and uh, I don't care about this. Okay, you can see this green color just gives the explanation where the grain grows. And uh, we are lucky that uh, Australia has so many green colors and, uh, of course, Ukraine. I think uh, for India, it will not help too much because the uh, increase of the population in India very high. I've been there one year ago and I realized that the uh, increase in population about 30 million people per year. 30 million, just uh, one Ukraine plus every year and these small people in one year they will start to eat the bread that's why for us like for a country who exports the grain i think it will be big future ukraine quite big country not of course like australia but uh, we more than a thousand kilometers on each side and uh, we've got to see one of them it's small it's Azov Sea, and another one is Black Sea. I remember once I bring the Korean delegation to Odessa and show to them Black Sea. They came immediately and say, why is not black color? <laughs> Everybody is called it's Black Sea. Okay, it's the same color. <laughs> Maybe not so salty like the ocean or like a Mediterranean, but in any case, uh, you will not find the difference. And uh, we've got uh, direct access to the Mediterranean Sea, and after we can go not only to the North uh, African country, we can go around the world with our grain. I would like to explain about uh, land. We've got a lot of land. Most of this land we can use for the grain production. But unfortunately, like uh, all uh, developing countries, we've got politician problem. For example, for the moment, uh, most of this land, it's a property of small owners. It's about three hectares in one hand. And these owners, they cannot sell this land. They can give it only on a lease. That's why we have such a difficult situation with the cooperative. Because the uh, farmers, uh, owner of the land, they are not farmers. About 11 million people live on the villages, but only about 3 million grow uh, grain and uh, potatoes or something else. All the rest just uh, live on a village and take care about those own uh, small yard, and that's it. I hope in the soon future, state will. Uh, put the special law on which this small owner of the land will receive the <laughs> rules how to sell this land. 
because uh, everybody say, okay, it should be open market. But if you will see around the world how it works, it's not so open. For example, in Europe, you cannot sell the land to the foreigners, or you cannot uh, sell the land on a price higher than state put. That's why it's not so easy to understand how it works. Okay, in our yield. I can tell to you that the Ukraine can increase production just in two times now if we will grow the same on the same technology like uh, Europe does. For example, our yield about average for wheat about four ton per hectare instead of uh, eight ton in France. On the same uh, surface, on the same <laughs> acreage, we can uh, grow in two times more grain. If we will see the difference uh, which we realize uh, between 2015 and 2017 in percent, we increase about 30 percent yield on the wheat. And I think it will continue to grow up. The biggest problem for us, of course, it's uh, poor investment in seeds material, in technology, and uh, on irrigation. If before we had about 10 million hectares on irrigation system, it was 25 years ago, now it's less than 1 million. But uh, farmers uh, start to invest money on irrigation, and in this case, we can uh, increase the production of wheat also. This is the most interesting graph on which I would like to show you, I hope. Okay, this uh, blue line, it's production of grain since uh, 2001. And on a green column, it's export grain. And you see how it's going up. We increased uh, production for the past 17 years more than in two times, from the 41 million ton up to 85 million ton. And at the same time, we increase export in four times, even more, because our domestic consumption uh, do not grow. I think it will even decrease because of the decreasing of the population in Ukraine. And in the soon future, we will export more grain because we will produce more. And uh, like on previous video you've seen, every uh, sort dollar which arrived to the, uh, our country came from the agriculture sector. And uh, I made the small calculation. Each block, four years. And I put the, on each column it's a uh, uh, planted area, uh, domestic consumption, export, production, everything. And the uh, last fifth column, the biggest one, I just extrapolate this uh, increasing and for the future four years. For example, uh, first column, it's uh, 2000, second, 2006, after 2006, 2010, and the uh, extrapolation I made for 2018, 2022nd. And uh, I reach the production 100 million tons instead of 85 now. And uh, it's average for four years. And the export about 70 million tons. Here, statistically, I increase uh, the domestic consumption. Uh, but uh, I think it will be more production of flour, which uh, we will continue to export. For example, in this season, we export half a million ton of uh, wheat flour. That's why I think, in any case, we have no another choice. If we will see the profitability of production, we still be the most profitable compared to other countries. If you will see the European country, European farmers who receive the subsidies, uh, more than 250 euro per hectare, we have no subsidy at all. We have no support from the state and we still be profitable, even with such yield. And uh, if you will see, for example, uh, new seeds from the pioneer in corn, you, you will see 20 tons per hectare. And uh, I just beg for the, no. On this slide, you see on the middle, with just a red line, it's average uh, yield for 
all products. It's for sunflowers, it's canola, peas, wheat, corn, for all. And uh, on the middle, you see, we just uh, increase the yield. It's happened because uh, we start to grow more than 10 million tons of corn. 18 years ago, we grow about 3 million tons of corn. For the moment, we grow about 25, 30 million tons. It's just forecast uh, for the current season, which started in Ukraine uh, one month ago. And uh, our crop will be a little bit uh, higher for 4%, and uh, export should be a little bit higher. It's only grain without uh, oil seeds. And uh, if you will see with oil seeds, it's the same because of the increase in production of sunflower seeds and canola. And the uh, total export will be nearly the same figure we will see. But the biggest problem which we face on for the moment, it's uh, during the harvested time of wheat, too rainy weather. And on this rainy weather, too many sprouted wheat. That's why on a volume we'll have uh, nearly the same, maybe for one million ton less wheat than in previous season, but in quality it will be different. For example, in Ukraine we produce about 25 million tons of wheat, and our domestic consumption for million, uh, it's only four million ton. For Ukraine will be enough, I am sure in this. Question will be where will, uh, to where we'll export this wheat. For example, in the previous season, we export 17, even a little bit more million ton. In this season, it will be nearly the same figure, 16, 16 and a half. But uh, if on previous season, about 70% uh, it was uh, million wheat, we call million wheat since uh, 11 and a half protein. It start to be million. But uh, in this season, it will be, I think, 50, in the best case, 60% of million wheat. On barley, I remember when uh, we walked together with uh, ABB and uh, we were one of the biggest exporters of barley. Ukraine export more than 6 million tons, I remember such seasons. But for the moment, uh, we export just uh, 4.5 million tons and on, uh, on this season, it will be even less. Because uh, farmers decrease the production of barley, it's not so profitable like uh, produce uh, corn or soybeans. That's why I do not expect uh, increasing production of barley. But uh, from another hand, the price of barley in this season just uh, make again new records. For the moment, uh, in Ukraine, price for barley about 210, 215 dollars, uh, US dollars on FOB basis, compared to 150 dollars just uh, 15 months ago. It's just incredible how it's possible to farmers who work on a field to make such calculation. It's just black swan. You cannot expect anything. It's a surprise. For the corn production, we increase our expectation. For the moment, it's more than 28 million tons. I think it can be even 30 million tons because for the corn now, weather is favorable. Uh, so difficult. I feel, uh, sorry, I feel like a student after a big party. I could not sleep uh, during the night <laughs> after this jet lag and 28 uh, hours trip from Ukraine to Australia. It's the longest one. <laughs> now just brain switch off. <laughs> now I understand why Australians do not want to go to travel around the world. Of course. <laughs> It just went 28 hours to go. <laughs> okay. In this year, we expect uh, corn export uh, about 19, maybe even 20 million tons. In previous season, we export a little bit more than 18 million. And uh, for our market, uh, oh, I will back after, but uh, the main, I think, will be China. We export grain through the, our infrastructure. About 95% from total grain export go in on FOB basis. We load it on a sea ports. But delivery to the port, it's going 
mainly by train. It's about 70% going by train and uh, about 30% going by trucks and about 3-5% uh, going by river. Because uh, our river is uh, just in the middle of the country and uh, not so many farmers are able to bring the grain to the, this uh, river silos, much better to go directly to the port. If you will uh, go, for example, three, 400 kilometers, much better to go directly to the port and you will get uh, better prices. That's why railway for us is the biggest problem. Here, I put all together all data. Uh, we've got about 800 silos, inland silos for altogether about 40 million tons uh, storage capacity. And uh, after, like I said, about 30% uh, by trucks we delivered through the port, 70% uh, by railway hoppers, and uh, about 5% uh, uh, by barges or river boats, cabotage. After, we've got a uh, storage facility, port storage facility, 3.5 million tons. And uh, we can load uh, from these uh, port uh, facilities and direct variant from the railway hoppers uh, directly to the FOB basis. We can load about 60 million tons. And I put their prices. Uh, you can see the, the cheapest delivery, of course, is by barges. But it's the longest way. It's about eight days. And uh, on the second place, it's the uh, railway. And the third, it's trucks. Trucks are the most expensive. And the uh, transshipment cost from the port to FOB, from the port facility to FOB, from 10 up to $13. I remember when price was $22. And uh, now price is just decreasing because the uh, company came and started to build port infrastructure. And uh, I'm happy to say that it still be profitable business because price cost of this transshipment about uh, five, six dollars, not more. And uh, traders are pay 30% profitability to the owners. Okay, here I would like to explain Ukrainian railway. How, uh, it's difficult. How to explain the railway, it's difficult. I hope the organizer will give this presentation and uh, to the people who will study this, uh, they will find where the railway. But uh, we've got uh, the third one railway in Europe on a size, about 50,000 kilometers. We've got the difference, our railway a little bit wilder than European. That's why when we go directly to the Europe, we have to change the wheels. That's why our export uh, on a border on, uh, directly to the Europe, not more than 3%, because it's more difficult, it's uh, delivery about uh, two, three weeks, uh, it's not so easy. Much better to load on a board and uh, go by boat. But uh, we have to invest in the uh, railway. This is about our roads. And uh, this is our ports. We've got uh, 12 uh, seaports. And uh, about 10, we've got uh, river ports. Uh, here is the main on green, you can see. And uh, here I put the figures of the percentage uh, for export. You can see the Nikolaev. Nikolaev, we call it like a seaport, but in reality, it's on a river about 50 kilometers to the sea. It's like a Rouen in, in France. And uh, before, Nikolaev uh, export about uh, 10, maximum 12%. Now it's more than 30%. And our three big ports, it's usually Chernomorsk and Odessa, we call them big Odessa port because the distance between Odessa, Chernomorsk and usually about 20 kilometers. It's uh, nothing. And uh, all together they, they do about 60%. You can see all these uh, four ports, about 90% from total export. All the rest, it's like uh, useless. And uh, yeah, because uh, only these three ports, they can load these uh, Panamax and Supramax vessels. 
and uh, all the rest port it's a uh, delivery for coasters for three five thousand tons vessels it's not a big market it's mainly to Turkey or to Europe or to Italy but the price for such delivery for logistic it's uh, just incredible higher for 20 25 dollar per ton that's why most of the farmers prefer to bring the cargo to the Panama port and receive much better prices I put again too many data. Uh, I just divided uh, who is owner of the terminal on which region. On Nikolaya, for example, we've got uh, Bunge, Kofka, Nibulon. In uh, big Odessa, we've got ADM, we've got CHS there. And uh, in Yushni, MV Cargo, it will be joint venture with uh, Cargill Company. And uh, in this season, they just open new one terminal. And uh, I think it will, people will continue, business will continue to build uh, port facilities. On this slide, I put uh, who is our main exporter on the past three season. And you can see that uh, nearly the same uh, names. It's Dreyfus, Nibulon, it's uh, ADM, Bunge, Cargill, Kofka, Glencore, uh, and uh, all these top 10. They do from 60 up to 70 percent from total grain export. Even when grain export is increasing, this company saves those percentages, so uh, saves those market shares. This I explain. I would like to explain uh, export of the grain from different countries. I'm sure Ukraine will increase the uh, export because we are the most profitable. Here I would like to give this data for the past three season, our export per month, just to give the you uh, our possibility. We can export per month not more than five million ton for the moment because of uh, railway. We have to improve this. And uh, uh, this railway belongs to the state. It's state company. And the uh, state start to negotiate with the business how we can improve the situation. They conclude the agreement with uh, General Electric. They start to buy the new locomotives because uh, for the moment the biggest issue is shortage of the locomotives. If for the numbers of wagon, it's not the big problem. For the locomotives, it's a big problem for us. And our top destination, of course, it's uh, Egypt, uh, China. I didn't want to divide the uh, European Union I just divided by Spain, Netherlands, uh, Italy. But if we will take European Union, this 28 country, it will be more than 35 percent. Third part of the grain export from Ukraine is going to the Europe. About 30 percent is going to the North Africa, and about 30 percent is going to the Asia. And uh, I'm sure that the uh, numbers of the Asian uh, export will grow. Here on each product you can see the Indonesia, Egypt, uh, Bangladesh, Philippines, uh, our main importer. Uh, for the barley you can see that China start to import Ukrainian barley and in this season we expect the increase. We signed the phytosanitary agreement between uh, Ukraine and China. That's why I think in this season we can face on even more than a million ton corn. Of course, it's China. And uh, I think Ukraine will have benefits of this uh, trade war between uh, China and uh, USA. But uh, I don't think that uh, uh, Australia and Ukraine we are such big competitors because uh, the increase of the population in the, in the world will give to us a big opportunity to feed up the world. Here I would like to show our uh, the biggest problem is bottleneck on the railway. We can uh, deliver per day about 117,000 ton uh, by railway, not more. For example, from the inland silo we can load in uh, seven times more, discharge on a port in two times more. And uh, it's because of the shortage of the locomotives. 
Here it's number of railway hoppers. Last column is this uh, dark green. You see we increase number of wagons up to 19,000 uh, wagons. And in this season it will be even 20. But problem is locomotives. Here I would like to, it's my last slide. Oh, he even in Russian I see. Yeah. I just make the calculation what, how, much, uh, how many wagons we need to bring uh, export of 70 million tons on the soon future. And I calculate that uh, uh, our state has to nearly double those uh, wagons, those efficiency. And this is world import dynamic. That's why I don't think we'll have big problem with the demand. Now world like a vacuum machine. If you can grow more, someone will buy this. We, are, we live in a lucky time, in a lucky years, and uh, we, we work on a proper business. We are feeding the world. We are not gun traders. We are feeding the world every day. Thank you very much. Nicolai, thank you. Uh, I assume you will take advantage of his weakened state later on with questions shortly. Um, but first, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Rory Deverell, Senior Commodity Risk Manager, INTL FC Stone. Dr. Rory Deverell is a Senior Commodity Risk Manager for INTL FC Stone, serving European and Black Sea clients in the grains and oil seed space. Rory's background is in agriculture and with an agricultural de degree and PhD from University College Dublin. He uses his mix of academic research, commodity trading and risk management experiences to deliver class-leading trade and risk management support to INTL's FC Stone's commercial and institutional clients. Thanks. Okay. Um, this may come as a surprise, I'm not Russian. Um, I come from the Dublin office in, in Ireland, but you can see that I am perfectly situated to talk about the Russian market from my perspective in Ireland. Um, so you're not gonna get the perspective of a Russian trader or a Russian person. You're getting the perspective of a European that sees this neighbor growing in influence. You're gonna see the perspective of somebody who's paid to manage price risk for his clients. So that's the perspective you're getting and how I would view Russia and try to understand that market uh, as much as I can to help inform my clients. Um, I'm always interested from a risk management perspective of as a trader, what am I facing? And normally as traders, we have to face normal circumstances, your white swans. What are normal in the marketplace? What's normal is inflationary type growth of supply and inflationary type growth in, in demand. So that's normal and what we usually have to trade. In an environment like this, things are getting a little less normal, especially the marketing year ahead of us. And this less normal circumstance is essentially one where the supply outlook is looking different, including Russia, and that's a big part of that supply outlook. So that's the perspective at a very high risk price outlook that we, we need to think about. Now, what you don't know is that I've been, as I've been presenting around Europe, actually a television program called Bondi Rescue has formed a very important part of how I present the market as I see it over the last couple of years. And my analogy that I've been presenting to the poor Europeans goes something like as follows. Imagine the scene of an Irish guy coming out of a bar in Sydney He's totally trying to wake up from the night before, and as you can imagine, it's not a very pleasant scene. He comes out, the lights in his eyes, and he says, oh, I need some water. So he spots Bondi Beach and he heads down. The problem is he's looking out and there's 50,000 other people already in the sea. So he says, where am I gonna go? And he eventually finds a part of the beach where nobody else is swimming. So he slowly goes out into the water and the refreshing, cool Pacific Ocean is bringing him back to life. But suddenly the sand gives away and he's out of his depth and he's floating out into that Pacific Ocean. 
And of course, he's now figured out why nobody else has been swimming in that part of the beach. He's been caught in a rip, something we're not used to, but I'm sure you all are. So inevitably, this is where the Bondi rescue team jump into action and the camera crews run out and they save the guy. Now, how this all relates to the wheat market, you might ask. For me, since 2012, the market's been caught in a rip. It's been dragged down by this growth of supply. And, we, and like our Irish guy, if you try to fight that rip, you probably, you'd never have succeeded. You couldn't go against it. So you had to go with this bear market from 2012 on to 2016. But if that Irish guy knew how to get out of a rip, he would have swam to the side. Swam, swimming sideways gets you out of that rip, as you know. And that's essentially what the market has been doing from 2016 up until about six months ago. And now it's defined where it wants to go. And there was always the possibility of that after that sideways pattern that we drifted further lower. But that really was outside the bounds of what would be likely given the cost of production. So we're really getting to the point of where the production now is the catalyst for higher prices. Now that rip was essentially caused by our friends here in Russia. And if you look here at the exports of, of Russian wheat and the purchases by Gast, the Egyptian buyer, you can see the share, that share of Russian supply getting bigger and bigger and squeezing out the French traders that I would work with. Poland used to sell wheat to Gask. The US hardly ever features anymore because of the dominance of Russia. And that is the backdrop to our rip and taking away demand from the major exporters. So this decline in prices now seems to have found its floor and where are we facing into now a fresh bull cycle, I guess, is the question. Um, and this is where we need to, again, Russia is going to be the centerpiece of where wheat prices go from here. Now, I also, as a risk manager, I, I try to break the season, my marketing year, which is July, June, I try to break it in, in more or less in half. Up until December, the market, and you see how prices relate to, to data and inputs, supply side data and inputs is what drives prices. And that growing relationship between supply outlooks and price grows until about December, and then we shift our focus onto ending stocks and demand. So for today, and in the environment we're in and the time frame we're in, supply is the dominant factor. And when you think about supply coming out of Russia, of course the area is expanding and there's just general growth in yields, but yields tend to grow everywhere. But this just relates the, 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 the pace of growth and how the gap is closing between Russian wheat and US wheat. Last year they produced exactly the same yield as the US. They perform as well with a fraction of the cost and that's their competitive advantage. Then you look at them relative to Germany. My yields expectations for Germany are realized. They'll actually close that gap even further this year, despite them seeing a lower yield. And that's a reflection of almost, it's as much about how bad Germany is as it is opposed to how good they are. And again, looking at different time frames, I want to give you one or two examples of how that Russian situation can have very quick, sharp impacts on price, and then longer term implications on price. Because again, I'm very price focused just based on the environment I have to work in. So one example I wanted to give you was back in 2012. And this is January, February can be a really difficult logistical window of time for the Black Sea. And what you're looking at here is the temperature in southern Russia around the Black Sea ports and the Matif wheat price. And you can see as the temperatures drop minus 15, minus 20 degrees, if you Google it, you'll see a whole bunch of pictures of vessels frozen in the Black Sea region. And the price impact was, was pretty steep and pretty immediate. The price of Matif quickly pushed higher. And it was a very nice relationship then and as the temperatures moved back up and logistics freed up, again, that eased off the price. So for that particular time window, that's the sort of temperature profile we're in, looking interested in. This year was very different. It was a very mild winter. So the impact, price impact was more relative than, than flat price related. And this was related to the basis, the premiums or the, the cash differential between it and the futures market. And what was interesting is typically that local price 
FOB Black Sea tends to get stronger, as you can imagine, as logistics get more difficult and we move into the deeper, darker places of Russia to get our wheat. This year that never happened, that cash price stayed cheap against the futures, against a lot of the other origins because of that mild, soft winter the Russians got. So that's again a kind of cause and effect relating weather conditions to prices and our price expectations. It kept them competitive this year. Now, in a very simple sketch it, if you wanted to, to kind of very simply give an overview of my world, my region in Europe and the Black Sea, you can split Russia almost in half. In the northern half, they grow spring wheat, and in the southern half, they grow the winter wheat. And it's roughly, in very rough numbers, the supply is half and half. Now, in the north, it's been arguably too wet and too cold as we move through the spring. So there's acreage implications to that. Now, as we move south into southern Russia, where they produce the winter wheat, it's been arguably too dry, uh, if not too hot. And then in Europe, again, you can split it in half, almost in the opposite direction, where it's been way too hot and dry in the north, and almost it's quite nice conditions further south. That, in a very simple sense, is how our region is shaping up. So we are looking at two areas in Europe of significant yield declines versus ye last year and versus normal. And the Baltic area of Germany, Denmark, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, I'm just, I've been there quite a few times actually over the last couple of weeks and months, and it is as bad as I say. I don't think the market fully grasps how bad conditions have been up there. And again, that southern Russian area has been the, 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 the center point of where there's an issue. This is just to give you a context of German production outlooks and how they compare to last year. That's a pretty catastrophic change in the supply outlook from the second biggest wheat producer in Europe. For this reason, again, cause and effect is kicking in. This drop in supply is forcing Baltic premiums. As we might discover a little bit later on, maybe that opens the door for Australia and, and certainly for Russia to try and, and squeeze into some markets. And the one I'm thinking about in particular is Saudi Arabia, very much a country where they get their supplies from Northern Europe. I'm not convinced Northern Europe is going to be there for them, and prices seem to be reflecting that. Now, if we break out the different regions in Russia and how they perform this year, we're not looking at 2010 or 12 type scenarios. One, it's not been hot enough, and then two, what seems to have saved the bacon of the Russian wheat crop in southern Russia is a very wet March and very good soil moisture in the profile ahead of uh, planting. So that seems to have saved yields, and we're probably looking at 10 to 15% drops in yields rather than 20 or 25%. As you move to some of the other regions, the Volga, uh, the Urals, and the Siberia, it's actually a little bit more normal than, than you might think. And it's just that early, kind of consistent wet pattern that they get seems to have eroded the planted area, but I still think there's pretty decent yield potential there. That uh, would be more debated by others than, so it, that's still open for debate, and ultimately we'll see how the production uh, evolves from there. As moving on to that production side of things, um, this is basically how it's looked in the past and how we look now. If you look, think statistically about where production ideas have changed, we can give ourselves a range of somewhere below 70 million tons is maybe your worst case, or sorry, below 60 million tons is your worst case scenario. And that really, for me, is the worst, worst case scenario. I don't really see it playing out. And maybe nothing better than 75 million. If I'm to put my hat in the ring, I would say it's a 65 and probably edging towards 70 million ton crop when, when we get to the end of this thing. But it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. Now, this year, the market, we, you know, we have the advantage this year over any other year that we have futures markets to give us a forward curve on that Black Sea. We're brokers of that, so it's really interesting for me to see the different price ideas. And you've got the price ideas of fund managers, uh, commercials, and local players. As you project the futures curve forward, the basis is pretty, still pretty uh, attractive. It's a low relative wheat price coming out of Russia, whether it's comparing it to uh, US values or against European values, and in particular against European values. So I don't see France, for example, building an export program into Egypt this year. And right now, Russia is just going to, to, to outcompete Europe for sure. 
The supply outlook, you need to take, you need to lump at this time of the year, in my opinion, Russian wheat production into a bigger basket of overall supply. And when you look back historically at how prices up until December relate to this overall supply picture, and of course Russia is a big wedge of that supply picture and the one most likely to change the most, so that's why we should have a concentration on it. But overall there's a good relationship between price and supply from these regions at this time of the year. And if again we were to project our range of supply potential and against prices, we're probably actually reaching a fair value today for wheat uh, at a global level relative to this supply outlook that we're facing. It can change, but really $10, $15 upside here, maybe $20 is probably as much as we might expect in terms of how the production outlook can change. So feeding this into a matrix of who sells what to whom, this is uh, uh, looking at the three Origins and origins of Australia, the US, and Russia, and where they tend to compete. Right now, Russia's got a very strong hold on Egypt, so they're the dominant supplier of there. You tend to have a very strong position into that Indonesian Southeast Asian market, and you can tend to compete mostly with the US. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But what's interesting is, is what doors might open this year for the Russians, because in 2016, Prior to 2016, French, the French traders owned Morocco. There was no, that door was slammed shut every year. But in 2016, when the poor harvest came in France, the door opened up, the Russians walked in, and new relationships were built, and the French traders will never get that dominance back. Geographically, they're in a good place, but the relationships have now been created. And diversity is arguably a good thing for Moroccans anyway. So, what doors open today? And, What's interesting is this, where's the biggest problem? The biggest problem for me this year is not Australia, it's not the Black Sea, it's that Baltic area. It's really that bad. Oops, that's my alarm clock from Ireland kicking in, yeah. It's, it's 6.30 in the morning at home. <laughs> you all think I work really hard now that my alarm's going off at 6.30 in the morning. Anyway. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, Saudi Arabia is really interesting because the heart of the problem for me is the Baltics, and the Baltics is a big supplier of wheat to there. If they're not there, it's a real pity you guys don't have a 30 million ton crop because I think that's a door that's opening, and it's probably a door maybe the ca Canadians have to fill to meet that, sort, that speck of wheat if you're not in a position to export it. So it's a little bit of, of a pity that you don't have the exportable supplies that, that could be. And from a Russian perspective, um, you know, they've got very specific high protein requirements. Whether the Russians can accumulate those really high proteins that they need, that's a question to be seen. And also there's the, the bug damage uh, limitations as well. So I'm not sure that Russia can walk into that door uh, either. So what are the doors can, can, uh, are opening for, for Russian exporters? Probably the Mexican door is opening a little bit within, in that NAFTA environment of trade negotiations between the US. So it seems that there is a bigger flow of wheat out of Russia into Mexico. So that's a door that's opening that they're walking through. Egypt, is that something that as, as, as the Russians try to build market share elsewhere, does Egypt get opened up maybe to US wheat, which is at some point, I think, going to have to get to the point of, of looking attractive against other values. Now, we do have the advantage of, of our futures contract on Black Sea wheat. It's available to trade and it is trading. This is just a breakdown of the open interest on it. We had a very big dominance on September positions, but now you've got a wider range of positions you can trade on futures. And they're getting more and more liquid as we move along. One of the advantages of them is that we can look at different positions, whether it's APW, Black Sea wheat, Matif, Chicago, and we can compare who's cheap for what position. And looking at the December position, US prices gave up a couple of months ago and dropped right down. Australian prices kept pushing higher. Now European prices are pushing higher along with the Black Sea. I think a win, that's forcing US prices higher, where maybe if you look at their fundamentals, their own isolated balance sheet, you mightn't want to buy it, but they're going to get pulled along by this. 
Now, when you include US corn into this matrix, and I'm, what I'm trying to do here is trying to find solutions. If the Baltic is a problem and Australia is a problem, where are the solutions? And I think as time goes by, the US will have to become a solution. In my head, they've always, they've become the seller of last resort over the last five or six seasons. I think they're gonna to have to become, to, 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 to realize that position in the market and become the seller of last resort. Right now, it doesn't look like they can, they're can. they really struggling with their exports. I think that changes in the next couple of weeks and months. Now, again, the futures prices all have, they have their advantage of information to us. And you can see that how over the last few weeks and months, the Black Sea went from, and really, six months ago, Black Sea wheat was just so cheap, whether it's in flat price terms, and in particular in relative terms. And that's what a lot of the fund managers, just to give you an idea of, of how we've seen some of the flow through the Black Sea futures, has been that the fund managers have identified that the relative value of wheat back then was super cheap when you look at Black Sea. So it made a lot of sense to buy Black Sea and sell US futures and Matif against it. And essentially that's what, how the, the, the prices have evolved in terms of that strengthening. It's still, in, I would say, relatively cheap. APW Australian prices have gone the other direction. Your own fundamentals have pushed up your price in relative terms. Now, what have I got? Am I over time already? Am I? Okay. Uh, there's one last, this is a, I think this is interesting, is that exports out of Russia right now, we're looking for 3 million tonnes out of, of exports of wheat in July. That, that's a big number, especially compared to last year. What's interesting, if you look at the sales of wheat into Gask, which are an indicator of how much sales are coming down the pipes, they're running lighter than last year. So they're loading and exporting a lot, but they're not necessarily selling a lot more. Um, maybe this is a flat price reason. I'm not sure. In relative pricing terms, I think they're, they're still the, 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 the most competitive offer in the market. But whether it's a flat price now is going to start pulling back on the demand side. So. I want to conclude, if I'm really, I'm really down to the wire here now, am I? Am I is the wire gone, gone and left us? Um, okay, so, if I believe the centerpiece of the problem is the Baltic region. It's not, I don't think, I wouldn't classify Russia as contributing to the problem, but they're not having the crop to solve the problem in the Baltics and Australia, and that's why prices have to go up. Uh, and I think Australia, or Russia, will be there to ease the pain, but not solve it. And I think the, where we go from here, I think a lot of the relative price moves have been made. European wheat is relatively expensive. Baltic wheat is relatively expensive. R Australian wheat is relatively expensive. I think all those relative moves have been made. From a flat price perspective, I think the solution comes to if and when the US releases that wheat to the world, or the wheat world goes to the US for the wheat, and I think corn as well is a centerpiece of how the, the anchor on this price and basically a part of the solution. That's where the substitution is going to be kicking in. And after that, all these slides are available, as far as I know, uh, to you. Have a look at them. If you want to go back through them, I'm happy to do so. Um, I put a lot of rubbish up on Twitter, so if you want to follow me, uh, I try to bits and pieces on the market and um, supply outlooks and stuff like that as well. So thank you and apologies for going a little bit over. I do have limited time. For, um, as, as noted, all of the presentations are on the AGIC website. Um, surely we'll, you know, th th these great speeches and, 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 and Nick Laney's self-professed weakened state is, is vulnerable for questions, so please take advantage if we have any from, from the floor. What happened to the bloke in the rip? Did he go back to Ireland or not? <laughs> I have to. I have a wife and three children to go home to, so I have no choice. Nicola, I guess a question from me. You touched on the, the need to improve rail. Um, 
What level do you think is achievable in the next, say, five to ten years, or are we going to see big improvements sooner than that? The biggest problem of improvement of railway is state company, and like uh, in former USSR uh, countries, all control is not so efficient on a state company. That's why we start to negotiate with the state uh, minister and state companies to organize like a joint venture, public, state uh, companies uh, where business will bring the solution and money. I think uh, on the next uh, three, five years, we will solve this problem with the railway. But uh, for the next two years, I am sure we will still have this. Okay. I think trade wars is probably something that's relevant for, for, to both of you on, the, on your topic. So that, have we got any comments there on how you see that playing out? Sorry, I didn't... Uh, sorry, trade wars. We, it, it's, it's a big topic at the moment. Uh, with Trump, we've got the Russians. Yeah. <laughs> with the Trump, we are lucky. <laughs> with the Trump. <laughs> I had uh, previous uh, speakers uh, who said uh, that some senators, uh, they are not happy, Democrats, Republicans. Uh, in Ukraine, we are quite happy. He gave to us support, politician support, and plus he... Uh, help to us uh, open additional market uh, in the world. That's why uh, nobody will ask me in USA, but uh, here I can say we are happy that Trump is president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> are you behind the misinformation going through Facebook, perhaps? Or? <laughs> Honestly, we need the support from international uh, community. Because like uh, all developing countries, I remember maybe six or seven years ago, I've been on some conference in Istanbul, and there one guy from Tunisia said uh, that after the revolution, I say, wow, 21st century, revolution, how it's possible. I didn't think that uh, on the next future, Conference, I will tell that uh, in Ukraine, after the, our revolution, <laughs> it's just incredible. Of course, the uh, Western world uh, is uh, better developed, and uh, you solve all your problem on uh, elections when you change politician. And uh, in USA, you see there's 51 senators, uh, Republicans, and 49 Democrats. It's uh, nearly balanced. In a developing country, it's like a kid's year. It's uh, not even teens. It's not even teenagers. It's, uh, we have to choose the way, and uh, we need the support from the international uh, community, how to go, how to grow. Because uh, some of the kids, like we are, say, why for you going there? You have to stay with us. Let's drink, let's smoke. It's much better than to go to increase your activity. That's why, of course, uh, we need such support. And I would like to send to all countries who help to us to increase our uh, activity around the world. Yeah, like I think it's fair to say that the 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 trading directions that we've become accustomed to are all going to change as the faces change. You know, there, there's the, the movie Trading fa Places, you know, there's the analogy I use is the trading faces. That's the environment we're in at the moment. And, you know, the most immediate, the obvious one is soybeans. That's the one that's seen the most uh, jumping around in price. And that's unlikely to change. I think grains are a little bit less exposed uh, then soybeans, but it's um, you know the interesting thing is this 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 flow of grain from from Russia and the Black Sea into Mexico. You know that that's that, that's new. So there's going to be new trade flows out of this that the market has to become accustomed to. Okay. Um, we'll close things now. We, we ran a bit over time, but I think it was worth it. Um, thank you, Nikolai. Thank you, Roy. Fa fantastic session. If you could please join me in, in appreciation. <laughs>